Valerie Steele. I'm director and chief curator of the museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology. New York Fashion Week is the first of almost a month of Fashion Weeks around uh, the Western world. So it's followed by London, Milan, and Paris. And they have additional Fashion Weeks, you know, in Tokyo and Johannesburg and elsewhere. But New York Fashion Week sort of kicks it off in the fall. And we've certainly seen that the upcoming season they're predicting short skirts. Uh, so presumably someone hopes that that old myth about the economy gets better and, and hemlines go up will hold true. Maybe if we bring the hemlines up, the economy will improve. Um, nowadays, it's hard to track any one set of trends because ever since the 1970s, there have been so many different kinds of designers. It's no longer the way it was in the past where you could say there's one new look and everybody has to fall in line. So depending on which designers you go to, you'll see somewhat different trends. But I think, for example, if you looked at, say, the Calvin Klein show with Francesco Costa, that was all about pale colors and about interesting textiles. So you have a, a somewhat, what looks somewhat rustic, but is in fact a very sophisticated kind of textiles that give a loose, easygoing approach. And in general, this kind of the short skirt, but with a loose flowing sort of body to the dress, that's something we've seen at a number of places. So even someone like Narciso Rodriguez, who tends to go very close to the body, very sort of body conscious, even he was somewhat looser, might have a sort of a, a racer back that was a little body exposing, but then the rest of the dress was sort of free floating and very summery and pretty. New York has the reputation for being more practical, more sporty. London for being sort of out there, um, Italy for being sexy and also sort of luxurious but it, not difficult to wear, and Paris for being the most high fashion, the most conceptual, and the most international. So it used to be said that America just copied Paris, and in the past, to a considerable extent, that was true. And I think that was really one of the reasons why they moved it, so New York Fashion Week was first. And you then couldn't say, oh, New York is just copying Paris because it was launching the whole season. I think in general, um, a lot of the most wearable, and this year probably some of the most affordable things, are going to be coming out of New York. The time lag between Fashion Week and when the clothes hit the stores is a huge and growing problem. Um, it used to be that, although it was the same amount of time, you didn't really know so much in advance. And now you see it within hours of the show. It's on the internet. Then it's in the magazines. And people are bombarded with information. But by the time it hits the stores, it's really sort of the next fashion week. And people are getting tired of waiting. They'd rather jump in and catch the trends as they're produced by fast, fa fast fashion houses. And so sooner or later, I think, there will have to be a, a reorganization whereby there'll be less of a time lag. And we'll see the clothes, and the clothes will arrive in the stores um, more quickly. And you'll be able to also buy them closer to the season. Because right now, we're seeing the spring-summer clothes in September, October. They'll hit the stores sort of you know, early spring, and there's this huge time lag. Boots have been a real perennial in fashion because they give a sense of mm, both toughness and also sexuality. So we've been seeing a lot of boots in, in autumn and winter for a while. What's new is now the very high boots tend to be seen as sexier. I mean, it's really drawing your eye right up to the thigh. And it's more expensive. It's more of a fashion statement. I think a lot of people are going to be buying shorter boots, and they'll get sort of some of that boot magic, but maybe not the real $2,000 extreme fetish look in boots. Hats have basically been out as a requirement since the 1960s, because the strength of hats was always to show your social status as much as anything else. 
And once people, women stopped wearing hats and gloves outside all the time to make a, a sort of social class statement, and men stopped wearing hats to work, after that hats became either an optional fashion thing, and of course they can be quite wonderful for that. We have some really interesting milliners, both in the U.S. and in England in particular, but it's a, a, a definite minority high fashion thing or it becomes a practical thing. You know, with global warming, um, you don't want all of uh, the sun rays hitting you, and so people are protecting themselves with hats. But it's no longer a de facto requirement of fashion that you need a hat to go with every outfit. I think men have no idea that shoes are among the first things that women look at. Uh, so many young women who are still looking for a man that's one of the first things they look at, and if the shoes look cheap or uncared for, they write the guy off. So, I mean, they, women know that men are attracted to high heels, and, but men don't really realize that women are really looking at their shoes. Jeans are probably the single most significant contribution of American fashion to sort of world of fashion, and they've been a really central part of late 20th and early 21st century fashion. Even in the 70s, it had really proliferated, so you had all kinds of high fashion jeans. Sort of, um, I think that's not going to go away, but I think that it's not necessarily that it's the $300 jeans that will win out. It's more a question of which are the jeans that the cool kids latch on to. Some people really are jeans experts. I mean, I'm fascinated by the fact that the Japanese are so obsessive about jeans that they really know exactly what goes into a perfect 1950s American jean, and they're willing to pay hundreds of dollars for a replica and thousands of dollars for an original. But I think most people are looking for you know, something else in a pair of jeans. It's not necessarily the best pair, but maybe just the pair that's trendy or the pair that will make their body look best. Style is important, but the Japanese are looking at, is it made on the same kind of looms? Is it a heavier weight? I mean, some of the deluxe Japanese denim are much, much heavier, and the dye process is done much more carefully to replicate the kind of indigo dyeing. There's nothing produced here that has that kind of uh, workmanship that goes into it. Why do you think it's so important to them? Well, they've really sort of fetishized to have the jeans like those jeans from America from the 1950s. We don't make them like that anymore, but that's what they want. The corsets, what made me go into fashion history, actually. I'd gone to Yale to do modern European cultural and intellectual history, and one of my classmates gave a presentation about two scholarly articles in a feminist journal arguing about the meaning of the Victorian corset. You know, was it oppressive to women or was it liberating? And it was just like a light bulb went on and I realized fashion's part of culture. I can do fashion history. It was a really a wide open field. And I was drawn to the corset because I think it's the single most controversial garment in the entire history of fashion. I think most people look at it as being um, something which was deeply oppressive to women and that so, somehow a patriarchal society forced women to wear it. But if you look at the history more carefully, and it did last 400 years, you see how um, it's more complicated than that. Women had a number of reasons why they chose to wear corsets, often in the face of male opposition. I mean, male doctors, moralists, etc., would say, don't wear corsets, they're unhealthy, they're, you know, they're bad for you, they're bad for your unborn child. But corsets were associated with upper class status, because upper class women wore them first. They were associated with physical beauty, because that whole hourglass figure, and particularly the waist-hip differential, are associated with female sexual beauty and being sort of nubile, childbearing age. Uh, and they were also respectable, that if you went out without a corset, it was like in the 50s going out without a bra. I mean, you were bouncing around. It was sort of embarrassing what kind of a woman would do that. So if it made you look more upper class, more beautiful, more respectable, etc., and your mother and your grandmother were pushing you, oh, you have to wear a corset. You know, how could 
a man can't dance with you if you're not wearing a corset. He would touch all this flesh, sort of soft flesh. There was a lot of pressure, um, often pressure put on by other women for women to keep on wearing corsets. And when corsets began to go out of fashion, it was in large part because new ideals of beauty came in. So, for example, one of um, fashion magazines that I was looking at around 1900, when women still wore corsets, they would ask these actresses, who's your favorite couturier, who's your favorite milliner, who's your favorite corseteer? And a lot of these actresses would say, I don't need to wear a corset. And you'd look at the photograph and you'd go, babe, you are so wearing a corset. But it had already begun to seem that a corset ought to be only necessary if you were old or fat or sagging, that somehow you ought to be naturally that beautiful shape. And so people started to internalize the corset through diet, exercise, and now, of course, plastic surgery. So in a way, it's not that we gave up wearing corsets. Rather, as our clothes started to show off more of our bodies, we couldn't hide behind the corset to just push the fat around anymore. We had to actually do something about the fat. It's true that 100 years ago, people liked sort of a woman with a big butt and big thighs. And, and, but they also liked women with a small waist and tiny hands. And you know, the fashion ideal changes, the beauty ideal changes, but it changes maybe less than some people think. It's still very much a, the same waist-hip differential that Marilyn Monroe had and Twiggy had and Elle McPherson had. All of them have a 0.7 waist-hip differential. The breast size may change, but that waist-hip is the same, and that's kind of what the corset was creating. There's been a lot of study on what defines beauty, and it, it's pretty clear that it's Cross-culturally, there are a lot of things which are the same. Good skin, so no skin diseases, good teeth, and um, symmetry of features, so that you don't have a kind of lopsided face, which might indicate that there was something genetically wrong. And youth. I mean, too bad for us who are getting old, but in fact, universally, young people are thought of as more attractive than, than older people. America is a country that has a really strong Puritan heritage, and that means a really strong anti-fashion heritage. So for centuries, there's been the sense, very widespread in American culture, that if you think too much about fashion, you're vain and frivolous, and it's a waste of money. Um, and a lot of women enjoy fashion, but they also feel somewhat guilty or ambivalent about it. At least in France and Italy, there's much more of a sense that fashion for men and women alike is part of putting your best foot forward, and that, of course, you want to look attractive and so on. Whereas in America, there's a little bit of that sense that it's a, a false mask. You're trying to look richer and sexier and younger than you really are. So you see a lot of criticism of fashion within our culture. Um, the degree of interest in the latest fashion is only moderate within American society as a whole. People want a little bit of a trend fix, but most of them are not going to go wholeheartedly into a new look every season. Whereas if you look at France, for example, they might go into a really new look and wear it to death every day, and then at the end of the season be willing to say, you know, that's it, it's over, now we're on to a new look. I think a lot of Americans like to think they would want to carry on something that was more a personal style that they would bring into the future with them. Fashion is never really a dirty word for young people. Um, and I think there's a lot of really enthusiasm for fashion, which we've seen come out with the enthusiasm for Michelle Obama's fashion sensibility. As though a lot of American women said, see, there's someone who's intelligent and educated and accomplished, and she enjoys fashion. That kind of authorized a lot of women to say, you know, I enjoy fashion too. It's something which is a personal pleasure. It's, I'm not just a fashion victim being exploited by the industry. The museum at FIT is a specialized fashion museum. So we usually have four shows a year, two special exhibitions, and then two in our fashion history gallery. The special exhibition this year happened to be on Isabel Toledo, who we had chosen and given an award to 
months before Michelle Obama wore her clothes on Inauguration Day. We were able to borrow that outfit from the White House, from Michelle Obama's closet, and put it on display. So that was the special exhibition. And we traced Isabel's entire career. Meanwhile, in the Fashion History Gallery, Every six months, we have a new show that traces 200 years of fashion history with a theme. It could be luxury, exoticism, color. And I had some of my younger curators, and they wanted to have a show that talked about messages in fashion. But that was a really vague topic, what kind of messages. One of the messages they mentioned was politics. And I said, look, that's such a great topic, especially this year. Why don't you try and do a whole show about fashion and politics? But think of politics in broad terms, not just what candidates wear or what their supporters wear, but think of the politics of class, race, gender, sexuality, and then trace this. So 19th century denim, for example, which talked about class and how working class people wore different things. And then in the end, we also had, of course, more specific political things, paper dresses that supporters of Richard Nixon wore or a dress that uh, Mrs. Reagan had worn. And then also designs that uh, were created and worn either by Michelle Obama or uh, by Obama supporters. So all of that was in the show. Well, black's an, an interesting color because we think of it maybe as having once been the morning color and then later on become the sort of the fashion color. But in fact, there's always, or for centuries, there's been a good black and a bad black. I mean, black's been about mourning and also sort of evil, death, night, etc. But there's also been the sense that black was an elegant color. Black dye was traditionally very expensive, so aristocrats wore black. And uh, it was ascetic, you know, nuns wore black, but also it was sexy. You know, sort of prostitutes wore black stockings. In the 20s, you had the little black dress, and it had a sort of a chic as a, a real reaction to the bright colors that had been in fashion a few years before. Then it went out again. In, in the 50s, again, the black was very much a fashion color that designers like Dior and Balenciaga liked because it drew your attention to the lines of the dress. Uh, there were no distractions from color or pattern. You were focusing on the silhouette of the dress. Then it went out again for decades, and then the Japanese helped bring in a new kind of uh, sort of avant-garde black, which picked up on all of those things, the, the charismatic black of the elegant, and also beatnik black, and the black leather jacket, the kind of charisma of evil that was associated with black. Because not just princes and priests, but also executioners wore black. It has layers of meaning, and I think that makes it very useful as a fashion color because you can tilt towards the elegant side or the diabolical side. You know, the, the devil's the prince of darkness, but the dandy's the black prince of elegance. I think it's not accidental Chanel made black so central because she was really the first female dandy. So certainly everybody loves color, but in a sense, color comes and goes, but black keeps coming back with all these myriad meanings. A lot of designers have a really smart eye about fashion because that's what their life is about. It's sort of trained to look for new trends. A lot of buyers also are very knowledgeable. But, you know, I think also a lot of ordinary consumers have become more and more visually intelligent about fashion because they've been so deluged with images. I think everyone has a kind of amazing sort of mental Rolodex of fashion images that goes through their minds. I know I'm in a strange position when I go to fashion shows because I'm not looking for the new trend, like the, the journalist. I'm not looking for what I think people will buy, like the department store people. But I'm looking for what might trigger something for a new exhibition, uh, something that will start an idea. I'm, for example, when I was working on a show called Love and War, The Weaponized Woman, I was at uh, the Dior Haute Couture show a couple of summers ago. And Galliano sent out all of these women in kind of samurai armor. And I was just jumping up and down in my seat going, that's my show. I can't believe it. I so, feel so validated that Galliano is doing this, which is exactly what I have in mind. And so I called his PR and I said, you know, could I borrow something? And she's 
but Valerie, this is the new show. We, this is the new collection. We have to show this to buyers. And I said, you don't understand. This is my show. It's so perfect. I have to include something from this collection. So that's really exciting. Or when I worked on my show, Gothic, Dark Glamour, and I started tracking down not just kids who were goth kids, but a, a wide variety of designers who were inspired in one collection or another by something gothic. That was really thrilling to track down how the gothic sensibility appealed to different designers in very different ways. In sort of historical terms, all-time fashion greats would be people like Chanel or Madeleine Vianney, Balenciaga, Charles James, Halston. Um, Today, I think you would have to mention people like uh, Karl Lagerfeld and um, John Galliano, Alexander McQueen, Mucha Prada. I mean, there, there are a number of people who are extremely influential on fashion. And that, I think, is um, a big part of what it means to be important in fashion. That, and one of the things we look at as we run a fashion museum, which is to try and think, what kind of fashion pushes fashion forward. It's not just enough to do something which is a beautiful version of the current fashion. The important designers push it forward to something new. In American fashion, I think that the two Malevi sisters at Rodarte are extremely creative. And we've been buying some of their work for the museum. It's like buying contemporary art. It's kind of a an educated guess. We don't know for sure whether they'll turn out to have an influence in fashion, but they seem so creative and so different, and I think what they do is so beautiful, we're sort of placing bets that we think they'll be important in fashion. Nobody really dictates fashion. I think a lot of people believe that designers are kind of cabal who plot that they'll have a new style and then that will put everything you have out of fashion. It doesn't work that way. Most fashion changes incrementally, a little bit season by season. Um, editors are gatekeepers of a sort. They're presenting what they think are the important trends. And retailers are also gatekeepers of a sort. Because they buy what they think their customers will ultimately purchase. But you know, their fashion's not only in clothes, but also in food and music and even names. You know, if you name your child Christopher, and you suddenly discover that there are lots of other little Christophers in his nursery school class, there's no group of people who are promoting the idea of naming your child Christopher. There's no money behind it, no advertising campaign. But names go in trends just as clothes do. It really is a kind of mysterious something in the air moving from what was the most popular style or name or dance style last season, kind of gradually Individual designers can have an input in that, but as Christian Dior said, they're just proposing. Ultimately, it's uh, the customers who decide what's going to be the new fashion. It's very hard to sum up a decade, and decades don't really quite work in terms of fashion. We do think of, you know, the 70s as the decade the taste forgot, you know, and, and the 80s as, as a kind of sort of decade of excess, the 90s of minimalism, or sometimes people talk about the 90s in terms of grunge, but that was a much more short-lived term. I think that probably, my guess would be, if people look back at the early 21st century, they would start to see more and more globalism in fashion, and particularly the rise of um, Russia and China as more of an influence. These are people who are buying more and more of the fashions, they're producing more, and I think they're going to be much bigger players in fashion. So I would guess that when we look back on it, we'll say, oh, we didn't notice so much at the time, but a lot of the taste that's being expressed is really appealing to, say, the new Chinese high fashion customer. Mm -hmm.